I really appreciate the most warm welcome that we've received, my husband and I, in visiting Sweden this, this time and um, in preparing for our big move here. And I'm thrilled with the opportunity now to meet and discuss at a more, somewhat more technical level um, what's going on here. It's been such an inspiration, um, not only for me, but for the whole world. Um, the foundation that has been developed here at the Bayer and that is now um, inspiring a lot of the work at the Resilience Center. Uh, so what I thought I would do just to open up really briefly and then um, let the researchers here at the forefront um, lay out what, what's really going on is look back um, for a couple of minutes at where we've come sort of since 1992 or sometime back and then assess, you know, where should we head strategically in order to drive innovation and impact of natural capital approaches. So um, the key thing, it even came up in the ceremony last night, was how do we get beyond New York City and Costa Rica? That was kind of a worry for many years, was that we had a couple of places that were quite um, interesting, high visibility places, very charismatic. Um, that had successfully implemented ecosystem service related ideas. But the question was, would any other city like New York ever be able to take up those ideas and implement them in their own setting in a successful way? Or people would look at Costa Rica with its national payment system for ecosystem services and say, well, that's fantastic, but Costa Rica is such a, a blessed and unusual small country, you know, how would any other normal country do what Costa Rica is doing? So there are obviously four key arenas in which we need to move and in which there has been tremendous movement in going beyond New York City and beyond Costa Rica. There are now um, literally, I think, thousands of ecosystem service projects in the world that aim to move from the theory, the foundation built up here largely, into real world practice. But in order to have this sum up at a meaningful level and have it drive really transformative change in how we um, <clears throat> design our economic activity and metrics and things like that, we need still very rapid advances in knowledge across many different disciplines. We need to distill that knowledge into practical tools that normal people in their normal decision-making roles can use. We need to um, apply those tools and hone them in a lot of different real world decisions. And finally, we need to explore opportunities and create sort of platforms for replicating and scaling up the models of success that we find and determining you know, what are the ingredients of success and what are the conditions, the enabling conditions, the types of governance systems that work well for um, achieving better outcomes for people in nature. So now I'm um, scrolling forward to just the past few years, I'll describe where we are in a partnership that involves hundreds of people and well over a hundred institutions around the world called the Natural Capital Project, whose main mission is to take this theoretical foundation and put it into real world practice, building on the Millennium Assessment and other work. And um, the main tool we've developed, the overarching family of tools, is called Invest. And just to, um, I just wanted to mention it because there's a lot of scope for um, linking with the work being done here through this tool. Basically, um, it's not a matter of slapping price tags on nature, as is kind of a simplistic way of describing what, what this is about. Rather, it's looking at different scenarios or options, really realistic kinds of choices that societies face in different contexts and asking, you know, how would the values we get from ecosystems change under different types of scenarios as shown here? And getting down to um, more of a landscape scale, <clears throat> you could ask how restoration of this river system in California would, would affect these different dimensions of the social and economic system. You could look at the same in marine systems. So we've developed a lot of models for over the past few years. We've just been hell-bent on getting that done. Steve Pulaski has been a major player in this. Um, and just to summarize where we are, we have a lot of models for uh, terrestrial systems shown here in green, and <clears throat> then those for aquatic systems in blue, and obviously there are a bunch that apply to both. 
Um, and the three that are still in development, and then there are a whole bunch more I'm not putting up, uh, more in the cultural realm and things. But we're still working on blue carbon and then some aspects of hydrology. Um, but all of these models are in use now in about 20 countries in a serious way. Um, here are the major engagements. And I'm just going to tell you about two arenas where we have gone way beyond New York City and um, Costa Rica, and then kind of open up to where we need to head. And in that discussion, I, I know there are going to be many ideas, and it would be great to be linking the different efforts going on around the world and distilling out um, a shared agenda for both research and action. So just to give you two examples, the first is from Latin America, where actually it was officials in Quito, in the capital of Ecuador, who knew a lot about the New York City decision to protect its water supply by investing, you know, there are nine million people living in New York City, drinking water that is never filtered. It basically comes straight out of the mountains. Um, you know, how is that possible? They um, started seeing a reduction in water quality and through a really interesting process that's still going on, decided to invest in watershed protection at much lower cost, one to one and a half billion dollars, rather than invest in a big filtration plant, which would have cost six to eight billion dollars and had very high operating expenses. You know, so could that model be applied anywhere else? So Quito decided to apply it, and the interesting thing is that many other cities are now following suit. So in 2006, the Quito um, <clears throat> replication, in a sense, became reality. And what it involves is a wide range of downstream water consumers, including the city people, urban residents, including, here's a picture from Colombia, not Ecuador, but big irrigators, big um, agricultural uh, industry, paying into the funds, um, hydropower corporations, their beer, you'll be relieved, beer and um, Coca-Cola and other bottling companies, all paying into a fund. Right now, more or less on a voluntary basis, although in the evolution of this, everyone expects it to become regulated and required. And then <clears throat> those funds are managed by a governing body. This is all new, developing a new governance system to decide how to allocate the funds. And the objectives are to secure water supplies, and those vary, obviously, by the hydrology and ecosystems and types of water uses and everything in the different cities. And the second set of objectives have to do with human development. Uh, so the people in the upper reaches of watersheds that supply the services are usually not so well off, especially compared to a lot of the downstream users. So there's a range of activities that they go into, and this is highly experimental right now, you know, what kinds of activities should be funded to achieve the dual goals of securing water and securing human well-being. So there's a lot that goes into education, a lot of ecosystem restoration, um, here replanting cloud forest, here along stream sides, a lot of investment in sustainable agricultural practices and building capacity and credit and developing institutions to promote better agriculture. So that's um, what got going in Quito, and then the leaders who developed that have spread it like fire across the rest of Latin America. So since 2006, there have been about 12 funds set up, um, major funds for cities of over a million people, and these little rectangles show a few of them in different stages of development and design, but it's happening very quickly. Um, <clears throat> so that a few months ago, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and FEMSA, a big bottling company for Coca-Cola, have decided to implement about 30 new funds. So there'll be about 40 to 50 in just a couple more years. So it's an example where the ideas have taken off, and it kind of makes some scientists nervous. Are they, is this all going to be successful? Will the theory hold up? And how do we integrate across these multiple objectives? Uh, but it's exciting to see. <clears throat> and I think looking forward, I'll get to that in a second, the, um, one of our major challenges is to evaluate these types of programs and develop standards and guidelines that aren't rigid. Obviously, each place is different, but that help um, <clears throat> accelerate the process of replicating and tailoring 
models of success to new places. So another, <clears throat> and the second, the final example I'll give of scaling up going, so <clears throat> the first was New York City going all across Latin America, and here it's sort of the idea in Costa Rica that was developed in the 90s to set up a national payment system for ecosystem services. The first carbon credits were created in Costa Rica. Um, <clears throat> the very uh, ambitious and capable government at the time uh, really charted new territory and developing new institutions and ways of thinking. So they created a program in which anyone who, it's all voluntary, anyone can participate. If you um, protect or restore forest, you get paid for that, for the wide array of benefits that come from forest. And now in China, what we see is also at the national scale, some massive um, institutional changes. The first is this National Ecosystem Services Assessment. It's by far the most technical of any um, ecosystem service, natural capital type assessment that I know of. You might know more than I do, but they've got people in 18 different key state laboratories, as they call them, real technical experts in many aspects of um, hard sciences, and economics, some social sciences, and in many sectors. Um, modeling change in ecosystem services over the past 10 years. And this is going to go into, um, you know, directly into government accounting um, alongside GDP. That's the intent. The second big thing of many that's going on in China that I'll mention is the government has decided to um, put 25% of national land area into a special status that will be zoned with natural capital protection as a priority. Um, and so you can see these new ecosystem function conservation areas, as they call them here. Um, and at the national, they have many different benefits, obviously, supplied by each place that's marked out here. But at the national scale, what the central government wants is listed here. Soil conservation for um, especially controlling dust and sandstorms and you know, lots of reasons that I don't need to explain here. Water resources conservation, flood mitigation, biodiversity conservation, okay, and here's the sandstorm prevention. So all that adds up to about 25%. It's deliberately all across all provinces. Each province has about 25% of land designated for natural capital protection. The other set of goals that goes along here is um, poverty alleviation and human development. So they're trying to develop, you know, and it's another big experiment, ways of integrating these agendas of securing natural capital and human well-being. And the way they're implementing this, they've, they've used INVEST to delineate these areas at the national scale. Now they're diving into detail in each place and proposing certain demonstrations that have to be successful before they really implement the policy nationwide. So we're working together with different groups, um, especially the Chinese Academy of Sciences and also a major public policy school at Xi'an Jiao Tong University to evaluate in both biophysical and also human well-being terms um, approaches that could achieve those dual goals. And each of these sites, I, I'm not going to get into detail, but they have a lot going on, you know, massive infrastructure investment massive uh, changes in land cover, um, agricultural development, other things, water issues, hydropower. Um, and the other thing that goes on in China, much more than any other place I know, is policy evaluation. Really looking seriously at how effective um, certain policies are in achieving their objectives and you know, really assessing critically uh, what can be done to improve them. So now, just to close on the next frontiers and really let the um, next speakers take this away, but um, for us to be thinking about and talking about in discussion, I want to say in three arenas, you know, we need to advance our tools and approaches in specific decision context. We can get very specific about where we could make a really big impact. And the four that the Natural Capital Project is presently focused on, we're not very far in any of these, but is in spatial planning, we're furthest in that, in the China case as an illustration, 
agriculture and food security, we're not very far there yet. In infrastructure investment, we are getting further there. We're working in a number of major infrastructure investment projects and with development banks and other big investors. Um, and finally, climate adaptation, and we're, we're just getting going in that arena. But we're developing tools that are very specific to these contexts. Second, and this is one thing I hope to do together with people at the Bayer and the Resilience Center and across Sweden, actually, is kind of look back and synthesize where are we now and develop together in a very inclusive pro process that's very diverse and international with good representation from many parts of the world, um, a strategy for going forward to enhance our impact. So understanding what the conditions are for success, developing a shared vision for accelerating change and engaging key leaders. And then finally, we need to go a lot further in linking ecosystem services and all this work on the biophysical and kind of economic side to other metrics of human well-being, um, looking especially at health outcomes and then in the human development context at the major um, agendas there that we see as Gita Sen in a really fun conversation last night was pointing out, you know, just go on in parallel with but never really link up with the agenda I've mainly been talking about here. So we could be a lot more strategic and engage and move ourselves much more toward the direction of people driving these agendas and find ways to be effective together. So um, let me just say again, <laughs> I'm hoping to learn Swedish right now. But we'll stick to English, but um, talk so much, and I'm looking forward to this whole discussion.